Any pilot can describe the mechanics of flying, but what it can do for the spirit of man is beyond description. So there's a lot of buzz about this new show, Masters of the Air. These guys were part of the 8th Air Force and they flew the B-17 Flying Fortress Heavy Bombers. All that being said, let's get to the focus of today's video. Let's talk about the airmen and aviators in those planes. How exactly are these guys so damn stylish? Seriously, the series seems pretty realistic, yet you can't help but notice, at least your girlfriend has, how handsome these guys are. And yeah, some of it is that these guys are great looking Hollywood actors. As you can see here, your pappy, your great granddad, he was a friggin Chad. In today's video, gents, I'm breaking out the five reasons why aviators are so damn stylish. To be specific, why the pilots of World War II had so much drip. And I know, maybe I shouldn't be using that word, let's go with swagger. Now, a lot of you guys know that I served in the United States Marine Corps. I was an officer with 3rd Battalion 1st Marines, basically the infantry. But what you may not know is the first two years of my service, I was a student naval aviator. Yes, I had an air contract. I was on the path to get my wings. I went through Pensacola, the training there, and then I went out to Corpus Christi Naval Air Station. And unfortunately there, flying a T-34, I blew out my sinuses in a penetration dive. I'm sharing all this with you because I want you to understand for two years, I lived the life of an aviator. And I stayed in touch with a lot of my buddies that went on to fly F-18s, Harriers, Sea Stallions, Ospreys, and Hueys. And I have to admit, my time with the wing was really enjoyable and it gives me insights as to why these guys come off as so attractive. Now, before I share with you the first reason why aviators are so damn stylish, let me give you a little bit of background on aviation history. So, as many of you guys know, the first recorded flight was on December 17th, 1903 by the Wright brothers near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Within 10 years, flight went from being something that was hypothetical to all of a sudden we were gearing up for the First World War and flight was seen as an innovation that could help win the war. In the 1930s, we saw greater range, we saw faster speeds and better reliability. That last one key because civilians wanted something safe and we saw the introduction of the Douglas D-3. This changed everything for the average person, actually most people couldn't afford it, but the idea that somebody could travel from New York to Los Angeles in a matter of hours versus days was revolutionary. And that takes us to the first reason why aircrew, why pilots, why aviators were so damn stylish because they were at the cutting edge of innovation. Nowadays, we take the idea of flight as a Given. Of course, it's a technology we've been using for over a hundred years. But in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, this was something most people had never experienced. In fact, if you had even flown in a plane, people would stop and ask you what the experience was like. They treated you like a superstar. So for there to be a class of professionals that did this for a living and day in, day out flew up in the clouds, this was seen as amazing. Pilots were romanticized. The idea that they could fly from one country to another, fly across the globe in a matter of hours, this was very attractive to the public. And right with that, we got the next point, media representation. In fact, Time's first man of the year in 1928 was Charles Lindbergh. And that was during peacetime when the war started in the early 1940s. It was the young, dashing, attractive pilots and airmen that would take center stage. Now, as a Marine, I know for a fact we have the best uniform. But when it comes to an idea of romanticism, especially to the general public, people love the idea of in battle, you've got one pilot versus another. You've got two gr small groups pitted against each other in this sterile environment, removed from trench warfare, moved from the dirty fighting on the ground. And the media and their representation of pilots, they fed into this. Aviators on both sides of the war, both in World War I and especially World War II, were portrayed as dashing heroes, which of course they were, but damn, they were photogenic. Gents, if you want to step up your style efficiently and effectively, look for a proven path. A curriculum that saves you from confusion, from bad information, from crappy teachers. You want to make sure that you're not just learning facts, but you actually are being shown concepts. Lessons that give you foundations, they give you the fundamentals to be able to dress sharp in any situation. It's also great if you can surround yourself with like-minded men, because how many times have you tried to learn something and there are other people that don't want to be there, they're distracting you, or worse, they're tempting you to go do something else. Which is why, gents, I wanted to show you this, my new free group group for you that not only has instruction, but an amazing community that is distraction free. It's got a great app. And did I say it's free guys? I developed this for you. Finally, I found a platform that makes this so simple, so easy, and so effective for you to be able to step up your style. Seriously, gents, I've got courses in this community that I used to sell 
you can get for free. I've set up prizes. I've gamified it. Guys, I'm going to link to it down in the description. Or if you just want to go over to the URL, it's at school.com slash RMRS. This group is free, although you do have to answer three questions questions. These que I don't ask for your email address. I simply want to make sure that we keep spammers out of the group. It's a high quality group. It's an amazing community that I am proud to give to you guys. Now, I do have two more very interesting psychological reasons, but since we are a men's style channel, let's get into the clothing. Yes, aviators and their choice of attire did play into why they were so stylish. But really quick, let me restate that. These guys really didn't have a whole lot of choice. You see, most clothing in aviation is functional first. By that, I mean the pieces selected had to serve a purpose. They had a very functional role when you're flying at high altitudes. First up, in an unpressurized cockpit, once you go above like 5,000 feet, guys, it starts to get really cold. Most of them had insulated suits, they had insulated boots, and they wore flight jackets. Now, I have an entire video on flight jackets, which I will link to at the end of this video, but a quick summary. First up, we've got the A1 flight jacket. This was introduced in the 1920s and is considered the first military flight jacket. It was simple, it was functional, it was made from cape skin leather, and it got the job done in the early days of aviation. The jacket most of us know and love is its replacement, the A2, which emerged in 1931. Now, the classic A2 was made from either a horse hide or a goat skin. It had a zipper front, it had snap pockets, and it had a stand-up collar with closure. Now, less common and designed for higher altitudes, we're talking even above 25,000 feet, was the B3. Now, this one was made from sheepskin, it had a shearling lining, and it was even thicker and warmer than the B2. Now, personally, I love the look and feel of a good B3, but it can be almost impractical because they are so warm. Now, what about the G1? So, this one was issued by the United States Navy. Now, this jacket was made from goatskin, and it did have a fur collar. It had button flap pockets and knit cuffs and waistbands. The way you could identify a G1 jacket is its by swing back. Basically, in tighter cockpits, it would allow easier movement. And really quick, I'll just mention the MA1. This was developed in the 1950s, and unfortunately, they got rid of leather. They went with a synthetic material. And yes, very functional, a lot easier to find and less expensive than classic World War II style jackets. But I don't know, not nearly as cool. Now, a good flight jacket can definitely level up your style. But another piece of classic menswear that works even in hot weather aviator sunglasses. So, Bosch and Lom created the aviator sunglasses in 1936 after the U.S. Army Air Corps had approached them saying they wanted something to be able to protect the eyes of their aviators at high altitudes. Basically, they needed glasses to protect them from glare and the rays that they were experiencing up there. And so, Bosch and Lom came out with these glasses that had this unique teardrop shape that fit around the eye. And interestingly enough, initially they had green lenses. Obviously, nowadays we find find them in a wide range of colors, polarizations, things like that. But in a nutshell, the early glasses worked because they would only allow light in at certain angles. This makes things appear sharper and gives pilots better vision, again, at high altitudes where it is really bright. Now, from 1939 to 1945, this was standard issue. Pretty much when you started training, you got a pair of glasses. If you lost them or broke them, you can get them replaced. But let's just say that anyone that's ever served in the military knows the way supply works. They, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. I want to get my hands on that and you manage to. In fact, one of the most famous guys that swiped a pair of glasses and wore them when he retook the Philippines is General Douglas MacArthur. And the next accessory I want to talk about, pilot watches. Now, the first pilot watch emerged in 1904. Yeah, the first year right after flight started, and it is the Cartier Santos. Even today, Cartier still makes this watch, and I have to admit, it is on my grail list. I've tried this on my wrist play four times, and if I didn't already have like 30 other watches I don't wear, I would grab this one. Now, this watch was named after Brazilian aviator Alberto Santos Dumont. Now, Santos Dumont apparently wasn't a quiet guy, and he'd been complaining to his friend, Luis Cartier, that, hey, it's very difficult for me to look at my watch and fly my plane at the same time. Can you make something that's easy to read? Louis Cartier said, sure, first up, it's not going to be a pocket watch. We're going to make a wrist watch, and we're going to make it with a large dial with easy to read numbers. And then to this day, that is still one of the key characteristics of an aviation watch. They are going to be larger. You look over at Breitling, you look over at Bell & Ross. All of those watch dials are going to be large and easy to read. But getting back to the early days, the wearing of a watch was key because if you wanted to have a coordinated strike. Seriously, you've watched these crazy movies from World War One where they blow the whistle and everyone jumps out of the trenches and does that suicidal run. 
Well, the idea here, if they did it right, is they would coordinate with artillery and eventually airstrikes. Now, this may come as a surprise to some of you guys that have never flown, but a lot of times pilots, they don't care what's out there. They're just looking at their instruments. As long as you can see the altitude, the direction you're going, and you know your approximate time. This is before, you know, the whole GPS thing. You could in many ways figure out where you were based off of maps, which was key because when you're up in the air, a lot of times you can't control the weather. In fact, you could never control the weather, but you're having to deal with whatever mother nature throws at you. All of this is a roundabout way saying that if you you want to look cool and you're going to choose a watch, choose a great aviation watch if you're into this particular style. The Germans had their Flieger watches. The British had their WWW watches. The Americans, on the other hand, we had a watch that was very practical, very inexpensive, but told accurate time. And that watch is the American A11. Nowadays, depending on the size, a lot of people would classify this watch as maybe a classic field, but with a larger dial, it technically is an aviation watch. This watch was worn by the Army Air Corps. It was worn by the Marines, by the Navy, anyone that needed to be able to tell time. This was a standard issue watch, which although primarily provided to airmen and aviators throughout the forces, you also saw this watch make an appearance on D-Day. Now, three American watch manufacturers supplied these watches to the U.S. military. They were elegant Waltham and Bulova. That being said, nowadays, if you're looking for a great aviation watch, you've got tons of options. You can go with a simple, clean look that almost looks like a dress watch, or if you want the complete opposite, something that you could even use to help navigate and to be able to tell the distance that you've traveled. And a great place to start if you're just getting into watches, but you love the idea of a connection to flight, check out a classic GMT. Now, the best clothing in the world isn't going to do you much if you're not in great shape, if you don't look good, which takes me to the next reason why most World War II pilots were pretty stylish because they were young. Now, some of you guys may be saying, well, that's obvious and may think even to the quote that used to sit on former pilot, general, and politician Barry Goldwater's desk that said, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots. However, there are no old, bold pilots, which is probably true, but doesn't do justice to just how young the pilots were during World War II, especially on the American side. Most of these guys, when they entered training, were between the ages of 19 and 22. These pilots were flying combat missions between the ages of 21 and 25. After that, the United States did a very interesting thing. They would pull back their experienced pilots and bring them stateside to do further training. You see, the United States had a strategy of strategic utilization of resources. They viewed their pilots as a resource, and after these guys had been on the front for six months or a year, they would pull them back. Almost all the other countries didn't have this luxury. They would keep their best pilots on the front line who eventually would be killed. The Americans, on the other hand, we were pulling back our best, most experienced pilots to train the new wave of pilots that would be there within six months to a year. As such, we were not only putting out a lot of aircraft, but we were putting out a high number of highly skilled pilots continuously. This not only improved training by bringing combat veterans to train the green troops, but it also would help to prevent extreme fatigue, which would hit a lot of pilots after they'd been in theater too long, and it raised the morale and inspired the other airmen to be trained by men who had been where they were going. Pilots over the age of 30 flying combat missions, yeah, it just wasn't happening much. So, all the pictures we see of these guys, these are young men at their physical prime. And we're not even touching on the topic of how difficult it was to fly some of these aircraft and how much stress they would put on the bodies, not only the positive Gs, but negative Gs, which are worse. Seriously, if you haven't watched Top Gun 2, one thing I really loved about that movie is that they showed just how physically excruciating it can be on the body to experience those Gs and how you got to tighten your legs up. In fact, modern flight suits, in case you didn't know this, they've actually got it so that they will tighten up around your legs to prevent you from passing out whenever you're going through high Gs. And a note on negative Gs, those are really bad because it pushes the blood up to your head and it can damage your eyes and it actually can kill you. And that's a great segue to the next point of why pilots are so damn stylish because they have got a cocky attitude. Again, Top Gun 2, remember that character, Hangman. Hey, Hangman, you look good. I am good, Rooster. I'm very good. I knew so many pilots that were really like this. Yes, they worked as a team and they weren't, you know, leaving you hang to dry like he was in that movie. But these are people that, yeah, they were cocky, but they could back it up. On top of that, World War II, at this point in aviation, there was a very high death rate. So a lot of these guys, yeah, they were in the army, but they weren't regular soldiers. These guys had a careless attitude. They were insulated a bit from the regiment of the military. 
And as a guy that went from the wing to the infantry, I can tell you this attitude drives so many infantry guys nuts. In the regular military, the Marine Corps, the Army, I'll tell you, discipline is key. It's everything. They really push in you. You got to follow orders. With pilots, it's a different thing. These guys are oftentimes up and they got to make decisions that there are no rules. There's no way they, they have got to figure this out, especially in combat. So even in the modern military, pilots display this by doing things a little bit differently. Their hair usually a little bit longer. The way they wear the cap on the head, we see this during the World War II photos. Look at how they got that tilt to it. They're, yeah, that's not regulation. These guys are having fun. And on top of all this, as a bonus point, let's talk about status, especially 1940s, a lot of training. In fact, not everybody can be a pilot. A lot of people think they can. First up, you got to have perfect vision, or at least you used to. Next up, you got to be smart. Pilots go through training and they understand not only the basic of flight mechanics, but they also have to understand everything about aircraft. They got to be able to not only learn how to fly a basic training aircraft, which oftentimes there are multiple ones, but then they have to be able to get into a regular cockpit. Usually these things are pretty darn expensive. So you're putting your best, your smartest, your brightest into these aircraft. So the reality is only a small percentage of an elite few actually get to fly aircraft. And these guys, it's just recognized that there is a lot of money put into their training. And when it comes to levels of status, yeah, these guys are highly prized. Take all of that together. That's why airmen, that's why aviators are so damn stylish. Once you've tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward. For there you have been, and there you will always long to return. But of course, you want to learn more about jackets, right? I got you covered. You want bomber jackets. You want aviator jackets. I got you covered in detail. In case you're wondering this jacket I'm wearing, I got it over at Thursday Boots. Great company. Not the sponsor of today's video, but I'll give them a shout out anyway, because I know some of you guys are going to ask in the comments. Check it out, this video right here. Yeah, aviator jackets right there. Boom, flight jackets, all different types. It's a good video. I had a lot of fun with it.